and we watched in real time for the first time that type of destruction, and I couldn't get out of my mind that news cameras were close enough to see people, and we could take pictures of them waving, but we weren't saving them. So I hopped into the shower and didn't think that soon these waves would be headed towards Hawaii, demonstrating my fabulous command of ocean geography. So I'm in the shower, and all of a sudden, my overly calm husband, that's actually David Beckham, but um, my who, <laughs> so, if you've met him, is you know just always really calm no matter what, says, hey Carissa, there's a tsunami warning. And I said, warning or coming? And he said, don't freak out. It's coming. And I went, really? You've got to be kidding me. I'm getting on the computer. I wanted to understand how tsunamis work, what happens, how fast they travel, what an eight wave mean. You know, I forgot to tell you two things. One, I'm on a cliff on the edge of the ocean. They've shut down the roads and I'm barricaded. There's one other thing that's critical. I'm Jewish and Sicilian, and both of my grandmothers are alive in Youngstown, Ohio at 85, and they're cutting off communication. These two things together, and I'm already guilty, right? Like, I'm thinking about guilty. So I go, before I even call my grandmother, I know that I have to have facts and I have to have data. No, there's been three types of medium exchanges already. First was the TV, next was my husband, Neil, not David, and the next was the websites that started to tell me how tsunamis worked. But I didn't have enough information to make a decision. Should I listen to the hotel? Should I try to swim to higher ground? They were saying, if you could hear the sirens. It's some essential oil. <laughs> right? I needed to say, I have a sample from yesterday. Um, I, cut that out. <laughs>
that we've done before, the big deal about the meeting was that you were putting information out there and there were comments that would come back from customers and you get trackbacks and pingbacks. The fact that it was a two-way sort of information not like the advertisement from Microsoft or us doing a request release and you just have to deal with it. Right? So for, for us as a company, it was very important that it was two-way communication in 2004. Yeah. Right, excellent. Is that kind of aligned with what you're thinking? Okay, excellent. So you're both right because if you look statistically at a definition of a blog, what makes it social media is the back and forth engagement. However, if you write a blog post and just stick it in the air and you're not encouraging that engagement, it's an article and you're totally right. So by writing blogs, we're not necessarily maximizing social media. It's the engagement techniques that Guy taught us about that really turn a blog into social media. And we saw this happen in Egypt. Uh, and I know that we've seen a number of different social revolutions since. But if you all think back to the story of Egypt and what happened there, the power wasn't in one person saying, we're not going to take this anymore. The power was in a million people engaging and saying, not only are we not going to take this anymore, we're going to tell you why, and we're going to tell you every second until you make a difference. And what did, what did the Egyptian government do? Who knows? I know people from my workshop know. Shout it out. Shut down. Shut down. They shut down the internet. And they said, not only will we not change, you can't tell us why you want to. Want to know what happened? The next day, this is the spike of how many Egyptians joined Twitter. Two million Egyptians joined Twitter the next day and said, we won't be silenced. And what made it possible was that Google got in a room within Twitter, and within six hours, they emerged with a solution called Talk to Tweet, where even if the government shut down your internet, you could make a phone call, and you could speak your message, and Google and Twitter would put it live for you. This is the open dialogue marketplace. We will not accept personally, politically, or professionally static communication because we don't believe it. We make our decisions today. We are spoiled, we are demanding, and gosh, I love it. We make our decisions through multiple mediums. And just to leave you, as we close our foundational section here of my definition, of social media, of blogging, of the open dialogue marketplace, is I can say whatever I want. And, and social media and blogging are really a place for education, collaboration, and entertainment, for voices and opinions, much like the early democracy are voted upon, and those that resonate rise to the top. And just like Starbucks who uses it for product development, what happens when ideas rise to the top? They get made. They come to fruition, they come true. This is the power of the open dialogue marketplace. It's really just an evolution of communication. It's not that scary, it's not that new. We've been finding new ways to communicate and new ways to command information literally since the beginning of time. And you know what, we'll never be satiated, ever, ever. We're gonna keep integrating, we're gonna keep creating, we're gonna keep moving faster. So guess what, if you're overwhelmed, Throw it out and let's go quicker. Um, I teased the workshops yesterday about Wikipedia and I asked if it was more or less accurate and we had some excellent debates. And you know, I know the statistics, I read the studies, I'm sure, I'm still not sure if I believe them. Um, but let's hear from someone that wasn't in a workshop yesterday. Is Wikipedia more or less accurate? And why do you think that? What do you think? More or less, I love it. <laughs> I continue to adore you. You know, it depends on the topic. I think that there are particular topics within Wikipedia that are highly accurate because they have a very dedicated, well, they have a lot of eyeballs on it. Excellent. And I think that there is a great difference between, say, a celebrity fan entry, where maybe, say, Justin Bieber, where you have a lot of lucky teenagers and tweens going in and messing with it all the time, versus, say, an Apple page. Absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. And very well, very well put. If I might steal that for future conversations. That's excellent. Thank you kindly. Um, <laughs> anyone have a strong opinion, yes or no? Anyone believe absolutely not? There is no way that Wikipedia, a self-generated encyclopedia, could be more accurate. Uh oh, we're all believers. All right, well, here's what the stats show. The stats show that because of the real-time nature of Encyclopedia Britannica, and because, in general, 
the number of eyes, the velocity of people doing the check and balance, and it's actually 11% more accurate than Encyclopedia Britannica. However, I am the granddaughter of an educator. If I rely on what's online, I'm going to feel a little concerned. So we go back to that idea of full media presentation. If you think about what this really means, really think about the evolution of communication and you buy what I've sold you the open dialogue marketplace is really I can say whatever I want then what we're talking about is a reallocation of authority away from brands away from us as the executives to our audience and we have two choices because we have lost control we have lost control we can either participate to work to build influence over our brand and over our brand perception, or we can completely delegate our brand authority to our audience and say, hey, we'll be whoever we want. Those are our only two choices. So I challenge you as we now move past the personal impacts and past the political impacts and really focus the rest of our time on what impacts is this making to your business landscape and more importantly, what opportunities does it present? Think about that. Think about what's right for your culture. Think about where you're comfortable and look to find on that continuum your balance between participation and influence and completely delegating your authority to your brand audience. Any questions or comments before I move on? I'm going to ask for some actors later, just so you know. So if you like to act, you can, you can start. Or no. Um, I like definitions. However, I don't like definitions for Wikipedia. Um, because I feel like, much like a regular encyclopedia, it is always completely technical. And what I'm looking for is, what does it really mean? So when Megan contacted me and said, are you interested in talking about blogging? Are you passionate about blogging? What does blogging mean to you? I absolutely freaked out and said, yes, I will be there. Because to me, a blog offers a tremendous opportunity to shine through with value-based content. And we have that great opportunity using Facebook, um, using microblogs like Twitter, even using emails or other things. But the deal with the blog is, is that when we go there, we've made a commitment to read it. We are prepared to spend more than 140 characters worth of time digesting information. And the key to creating really engaging, or enchanting if you will, guy, um, <laughs> blogs is to make sure that they're value-based. Value is always king or queen for those that were uh, in our email blogging session yesterday. And if you're asking yourself, should I put this out to my audience? Will it help them to win? Will it help me with brand awareness, with solving a problem? You have to ask yourself, will it be valuable to my audience? And if you think back to the definition of the open dialogue marketplace, people use blogs and social media for three reasons. To collaborate, to become educated, or to entertain. So if you are trying to figure out, my gosh, what kind of content am I creating? What do I do? Ask yourself, am I solving a problem? And sometimes the problem is I am really bored and I need to read a stupid joke. Maybe that means value, but how does your audience define value? And how are you going to represent that? So why do people blog? Who blogs? Why? Why do you blog? Trust me, we all, especially me, I love to talk and teach in the sphere. But we go to learn. That's one of the most valuable. And we heard Guy talk about this. I use Twitter for links. I think of it like a fire hose. I basically want to, you know, what, what I heard in my mind was I give my audience an MBA crash course every day in the most recent updates of what happened. What a tremendous education opportunity. And I won't take you through each one, but if you look at the power of blogging or you're asking yourself, if you're here at the conference to decide, is blogging right for your organization? Ask yourself if any of, of these pieces really resonate with you and if there's an opportunity for you to drive ROI by seeding discussions, asking for feedback, learning from your audience, seeding relationships. And if so, I would really, really ask you to spend some time considering blogging, or if you are already blogging, to really focus on value-based content. 
There is a myth that blogs are going away. You'll have access to these slides, so don't feel compelled to write all these statistics down. Um, I just want to dispel the myth today that blogs are not going away. We're actually seeing more organizations blog, more people read blogs, and more people gain value and drive ROI from the blog. And as you really work to enhance your blogging, just keep in mind that no longer is blogging text. There are full video blogs, photo blogs, audio blogs, and one of the best practices is really mixing diverse content into um, your value-based content. And I'm stealing my statistics from somewhere else, I can't remember where. Um, but the number one thing that people do in the social media sphere is comment on a picture or a video. So if you're noticing a ton of traffic to your website, to your blog, to your Facebook page even, but just nobody's answering, and you know, based on what Guy just mentioned, that that engagement is what it's about. It's not about writing an article and putting it online. It's about a conversation. Try a picture or a photo of anything. Well, of anything. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to spell the myth. Look at blogs, social media channels used by companies worldwide. It's number two. Look here. Corporate blogs have grown from 2010 to 2011 by 6%. And they didn't help me too much. Um, if we look here, we can see that in the top five resources that Fortune Global 100 companies are using, blogs, or blogs rather, make the top five. So we have to ask ourselves, why are companies <coughs> investing more time in blogging? Well, why do companies, well, not all the time, but why should companies do things? Because there's demand, because we want them to, because their target audience says, hey, this is the way that I want to digest information. And so it's time to switch our attention to the collaborative C3 class. And I'll just ask you to hold that term for a second and I'll explain what it means in a moment. But it's important to ask yourself, why is my target audience either blogging or reading blogs? What are they looking for? And there's another myth, I can't sell with blogs. I can't sell in social media, it's spam. Yes, it does not work really well if you're like, hey, here's a promo, link, 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 link. But if you're educating and inviting individuals to learn about your product, learn about their service, and you're helping them to sell, solve problems, blogging is one of the most lucrative lead generation and ROI driving marketing tools that you can use. And here's what individuals are doing. Isn't it interesting that the number one thing people blog about is brands? If you don't want to buy or learn about products or services from blogs, why is it number one? So if you have any individuals that control the budget screens at your organization and they're telling you, well, I don't know if I want to invest in social media that much. I'm not really sure why we'd allocate that much business. Pull out these slides. I'll make sure that you have them. And show them this one right here. When people blog, the median number of monthly leads among small businesses in North America goes up. Blogs are directly related to lead generation and to less directly related, as we see with the retail example, on the other side, to sales. Now, I ask you to, to hold the term in your head, C3. There's a new generation. Is anyone familiar with this term yet? You're probably already sick of hearing me talking. Yes? Tell us. No. No, I've heard of it. Yeah? Okay, she's hard to She's not going to tell me about it. Fair enough. I'll, I'll do my job. I'll do my job. You're on the spot later. Um, and again, I mentioned that I adore you. Our conversation last night carries on. Um, so there's a new class, and, and I come from an online advertising and recruitment background, so I tend to gravitate toward understanding generational differences and what makes people want to work places and so on and so forth. So I'm fascinated by the fact that for the first time ever, we have a generation that's not defined by age, but rather than by values. And the collaborative class is two things. Unbelievably demanding <coughs> and unbelievably engaged and ready to participate if you educate, collaborate, and entertain. So the values that you see behind <coughs> you are the values that are critical to the collaborative class. And if you are going to ask yourself to invest and taking time to message in the social sphere, it's critical that you infuse your content with these values if you want engagement, our number one goal. And I'll only talk about two, humanism and transparency, because I think we have all been educated uh, to, our, to our ears, if you will, on the immediacy and uh, the different 
I can say whatever I want aspects of, of these other values. Um, but transparency freaks us out, right? Um, you know I focus a lot in regulated industries. I spend a lot of time of, uh, of a lot of time throughout the day working with organizations that have true restrictions on how they can interact in the social sphere and true repercussions. And this word transparency is like one of the scariest things in the world. So let me ask you a question. Is the collaborative class defining transparency by saying, oh man, we had a really bad fiscal quarter and uh, I gotta tell everyone because transparency is important. I gotta go syndicate on every single social media property and every blog I have that our sales aren't there. We had a terrible, terrible quarter on I'm bored by. Is that the definition of transparency? No. Thank gosh. Otherwise, we'd all be putting ourselves out of business. What people are looking for is what does it look and feel like? What is the good? What is the bad? It leads into the second value here that's so critical, which is humanism. People don't want to talk to brands. If we wanted to talk to brands, we read a magazine. And magazines are great. Sometimes we don't want to talk back to someone. And I love the Wall Street Journal on the plane. I don't even want to talk to the people next to me. I don't want to engage with anybody. There's a place for old media, if you will. And integrating this new and old media is my shtick and what I believe in, and that's a whole other conversation. But people in the social sphere don't want to talk to brands. They don't want to talk to your company. They want to talk to you. They want to talk to you representing your company. And they want to hear words like I and me. And they want to know what you feel like as a result of what they said. They want to collaborate with you. They want to talk to people. So think about that as you ask yourself, where can I make an impact in my business? And I'll do a time check in a second because I know our schedule is a little different. But um, before I do so, I really would like to drive home the point that blogging, social media, clearly it's a tremendous opportunity for marketing, a tremendous opportunity for public relations. But you can use emerging media in literally every facet of your organization to solve problems. If you have a customer service issue, a blog, Twitter, Facebook, can be tremendous resources to really help you cut down length and content <coughs> time and the response time. And do you know what happens when organizations launch Twitter pages and a customer service? And we've seen this with a, with a number of our clients. I almost said a million, but we don't actually have a million clients. Uh, with a number of our clients, what happens is when consumers ask questions, your target audience asks questions, and you answer, one, you send just a perception message that, that you're a transparent organization that's listening. But more importantly, for your own bandwidth, Twitter starts to act as almost a running FAQ, a frequently asked question list. And other consumers that had the same question that go there realize, I don't have to ask. This has already been asked. The other thing that happens when we create segmented communities for different aspects of our business, just like we're comfortable engaging in communities that are more relevant to us, we find that our target audience is more likely to talk, more likely to ask questions if we create an online platform that's customized and specific to their interests, whether it be collaboration, education, entertainment, or a combination of the two. So, how am I doing on time? 20 minutes left. All right, good deal, plenty of time. Um, I wanna leave you with some very practical ways that if you, again, you bought what I'm selling here today, that this is an excellent tool to really solve problems, you can go back to your office and implement right away. Because one of my, um, I guess, uh, sticking points sometimes is, I, I oftentimes in a, a lecture or speech or a workshop learn so much and I have so many ideas that it takes me like five days to sort out, okay, out of all the things I just did, what am, you know, learned rather, what am I gonna do next? Um, and I'd love for you to be able to walk away with a strategy on how you can either enhance your blogging or begin to blog. Um, and if you're looking for core components, what's really important in addition to what we've talked about is that when someone goes to your blog, it is just as evident as could be as, uh, as to why they're there. What are you offering? What's the so what, who cares for the audience? And if that isn't front and center, you're not gonna get them to read the article. And you're certainly not going to be able to turn the article into a blog, or into social media, rather. Um, and what we've been talking about, really, the true goal of productive blogging, or productive social media, for that matter, 
is of course to create audience, or to create dialogue between you and the audience. And you want to invite dialogue, of course, from the audience to you. That's one of the best research and development opportunities we've ever had. But where the real power comes in is if you can generate audience-to-audience -audience conversations. And the reason that that's so powerful, more powerful than any trust or any message that we can create with someone in our target audience, is because the trust that exists between user to user in the blogosphere and in the social sphere is so high. If you tell me as a person that I should buy this alarm system over that alarm system and you tell me why and you tell me how it impacted your life and impacted your family, I'm much more likely to consider that alarm system than if Bell in Canada messaged me that they have the best alarm system in the world because it's 10% off. So you really want to look at that audience to audience dialogue. How do you nurture that? How do you create it? How do you reward it? And how do you cherish it and grow it? So if we could skip ahead, if that's OK, um, to section three. I need two actors in order to drive this concept home. Is anybody going to act with me? I'm really, yes, my god, let's go. Awesome. <laughs> We, we bonded, if you could only hear about our taxi ride last night, you would understand why you guys are back. Uh, I need one more actor. I'll have to pick on some. Yes! Uh -huh. See? Wait. See what happens when you call on me? No. I'm not generally that nice. So I need just one second with my actors, because this is completely, uh, this is completely, what's it called when you are in rock? Thank you. What's it called? What are we doing?
to uh, promote tourism to South Africa. And we were thinking yesterday about what kind of complementary, not competitive, but complementary opportunities are there to participate in groups. And you had such a brilliant idea that then we walked onto and used all day long, which was bird watching. Maybe I should be talking to people that are really interested in bird watching, and maybe I should dialogue with them and learn about the different kind of birds that are there and talk to them about the opportunities to see these birds in South Africa. And I literally got goosebumps and went, oh, you've got it, brilliant, yes, my work here is done, but I stayed to you. Um, and so ask yourself, where can you participate that you're not participating today? And what is the power of building relationships in that group? And as I mentioned, through this process of listening and participating, you are going to learn what to create. You are going to know absolutely what type of content your audience wants to hear. And in doing so, that natural engagement, that audience to audience engagement, will rise to the surface. So today, after you've listened and participated, go post one value-based thing to a group that you've never talked to before. Stretch yourself to connect with third-party complementary resources that will help to drive your brand. Um, and don't worry if you get a negative comment um, or someone starts to give you a headache, because remember that excellent value of transparency that the collaborative class demands in humanism? Clearly, I'm not perfect. I stutter over every word. I think I might even slur sometimes when I say social media, which happens like 900 times a day. But I'm human, and hopefully you bought it. Hopefully you connected with me, because I don't care if I'm imperfect. That's the point of it. I want to be an open dialogue marketplace. I want to learn from you as much as I, I don't care what you have to say, if it's negative or positive. I care that you have emotion. I care that you comment. So if you can tolerate it, and it's OK with your culture, allow negative comments to breathe and respond. So I'll leave you with a funny story, um, and if my workshop group wants to help me tell it, that'd be phenomenal, because we weren't going to go into it yesterday, but we moved ahead with the savvy group and we did. Um, if you're feeling at all hesitant or concerned about really starting to participate in third-party groups that are a little different and you're not sure what you're going to get back, I just thought I'd share the Comcast story with you. Is anyone familiar with this story? Anyone know what happened? <coughs> yeah? You want to tell us? Is it the Georgetown <coughs> Yes. You did? Yeah. Comcast? Excellent. You did a great job of recovering. It says well, a positive outcome. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you still get credit because you're here. <laughs> so, so you set the story perfectly, which is, wasn't this in a Georgetown apartment? What this is, is a picture of Comcast technician who mm -hmm. fell asleep on a customer's couch. What makes well, it worse are two things. One, he chose to fall asleep on the couch of a Georgetown Law student. Great, man, bad idea. Secondly, he is on the phone with Comcast, his own organization, trying to get directions on how to fix the issue of what's going on with the cable. And his own organization left him on hold so long that he fell asleep. Wow. <laughs> what happened? This lawyer in training comes in from Georgetown High in his bridges and sees this guy sleep on the table and says, uh-huh. I've got a flip cam, and you're going on YouTube, buddy. Boom. Literally 1.6 million hits in less than two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, it was quick. quick. And the brand damage was extraordinary. And people were angry. They said, this is ridiculous. I have always waited on customer service and long wait times. I am done. This is it. I can't believe it. Here's the deal. Comcast responded brilliantly. And I was surprised, but they issued a video blog post and said, this isn't acceptable. They issued a regular blog post that said, this isn't acceptable, and here's what we're doing to correct it. They tweeted, they put up a Facebook page, as did other people, like, I hate Comcast. Um, but they went ahead and said, Comcast cares. And they allowed the negativity to exist in balance they with a positive comment. They also video and uh, training text. You do? They, I think they, I heard that they did. They do? Yeah, they do. Yeah. That's really amazing. Yeah. And I'll close with this. The reason that that's amazing is because the power of the open dialogue marketplace starts online. But where it ends is an ROI, an opportunity to make offline improvements. And not only are they using it in their training, thank you for that content, that I'll now be moving forward. They also physically make customer service changes 
that allowed them on the back end to service clients and trigger. They learned it was research and development and they displayed humanism. So with that, I will leave you with the cost of no action is a lot more severe than the cost of going out and giving it a try and being willing to tolerate the level of transparency and humanism. So I'll close for any questions or comments.